My name is Chris Calkins. I am the Nebraska Beef Industry Professor of Animal Science from the University of Nebraska. Today I'm talking about the impact of distiller's grains on meat quality. Uh, there's two points I'd like to make as we get started. The first is that all of my discussion will be centered around wet distiller's grains plus solubles. We are not discussing dry distiller's grains. And secondly, I'd like to acknowledge the Beef Checkoff Program. All of the research results that you will hear and see in this presentation have been supported through Beef Checkoff dollars. The question of the impact of distiller's grains on meat qualities really centers for me as a meat scientist around questions associated with unsaturated fatty acids. Those unsaturated fatty acids are the ones that are most often oxidized and therefore they compromise the color and shelf stability of the meat. This slide indicates that when we take measurements of fatty acids from the duodenal region after the rumen, there is very clearly an increase in unsaturated fatty acids available for absorption through the small intestine in cattle that have been fed wet distillers grain plus solubles. When we measure the fatty acid profile in the meat, however, we see that if we look at just total gross unsaturated fatty acid or saturated fatty acid content, that we see there are no differences among the products and consequently the ratios of the two also do not change. However, if we look more closely at the fatty acid profiles, the polyunsaturated fatty acids suddenly become quite important. In this slide you can see that animals fed 30% wet distillers grain plus solubles in the diet on a dry matter basis have almost 50% more polyunsaturated fatty acids than the control group. This is significant to us because the polyunsaturated fatty acids are the ones that are most likely to be oxidized. Therefore, the ones most likely to influence color stability, oxidation in the retail case, and flavor. This is the result of a study where we actually brought in a USDA grader from uh, the regional office, one associated with training other graders. And the data here are to show you that in the next slides that I show you that there were no differences in overall marbling score among the three treatments, cattle fed 0, 15, or 30 percent wet distillers. In addition, there were no significant differences at all in marbling texture or marbling distribution, meaning that feeding this compound does not influence those traits among the meat products that we evaluated. This slide identifies the relationship between marbling score along the base and the percentage intramuscular fat on the side. Uh, we conducted this research because there was a question about the content of uh, marbling and uh, question whether or not feeding wet distillers would change the composition of marbling such that even though intramuscular fat was present, a greater, night, greater might not be able to visualize that and therefore would call a lower marbling score. Uh, fortunately, if you notice the three lines on the screen, they're all statistically parallel or similar. That means that at the same level of intramuscular fat, or fat within the lean, we would expect to get the same or identical marbling score. So the hypothesis that feeding wet distillers alters the relationship between content of lipid in the meat and marbling score does not hold true. Relative to sensory analysis, I want to point out first that we've done several tests on tenderness both using shear force as well as trained sensory evaluation. There are no sensory, uh, no tenderness differences among treatments. This slide is designed to show you an example of a study where cattle were fed 0 to 50 percent wet distillers and you can see no effects noted for any of the off flavors that are identified on the screen. This again was evaluated by a trained sensory panel. However, I do want to mention that these studies were all conducted on steaks that were cut after the product was aged in a vacuum package, which is to say that the steaks had not undergone retail display. Most of our consumers, of course, would get steaks from retail display if they're purchasing in the grocery store. 
And so a question remains about the impact of these uh, feeding dietary treatments on flavor after or following a uh, period of retail display. There's simply no data available to address that at the moment. However, when we look at rancidity development measured here in the form of TBA values, you can see that for both top blade and strip loin steaks, the longer those products are in the retail display, the amount of oxidation increases. Unfortunately, the oxidation is greater in those cattle fed 30% wet distillers compared to the control group, particularly after three or seven days of retail display. From this, I would conclude that feeding wet distillers then does compromise the rancidity of steaks in the retail case. Taking on the question of color, a start is a measure of redness. You'll see that over the course of the retail display shown on this slide, the redness of a steak decreases. That would normally be replaced by a brown color, so it represents discoloration. And after three, five, and six days of retail display, there was a significant difference between the 30% wet distillers group and the control group, indicating that there was less of that redness retained in meat from the treated animal. This is uh, the slide for tenderloin steaks. The following slide is for top blade steaks where you can again see the same relationship. 30% wet distillers in the diet fed on a dry matter basis causes a significant decline in the redness of the steak. We also evaluate discoloration of steaks. And so I want to show you examples of what discoloration is. In this particular situation, you see a steak that was just cut fresh and wrapped, placed in the retail case, no discoloration. As that steak remains in the retail case, we begin to see some brown occurring around the edges. And eventually, we get sufficient brown that we would call this steak unsaleable. That is, most consumers would not be willing to spend money to purchase this steak. So in the next two slides, you'll see an example of this threshold, which is to say that when steaks become sufficiently discolored that they would be discarded, and under normal conditions you terminate retail display. Here we see the infraspinatus or top blade, some people call that muscle the flat iron, uh, aged for seven days, and you'll note that the uh, discoloration level of four, which was equivalent to the previous picture, is reached by the 30% wet distillers treatment group after about five and a half days. The 0 and 15 groups have approximately another half day of shelf life. And by day six, those differences were statistically significant. I can tell you that when we repeat this study with uh, infraspinatus muscles that are aged for a longer period of time, discoloration of course occurs more quickly, the same differential, the same trends exist, and the shelf life differential is even greater. In the case of strip steaks, again aged for seven days, the differential is almost two days, and you can see well before that discoloration threshold is met, we can measure significant difference in color, and again the most discoloration occurs on behalf of the steaks that are from animals fed wet distillers grain plus solubles. So in summary I would say that feeding wet distillers grains does cause an increase in the polyunsaturated fatty acids in meat. It fortunately does not influence the marbling intramuscular fat relationship. It does not appear to have any impact on flavor uh, following vacuum score storage, although it's unknown any potential effects that may occur after retail display. Feeding wet distillers grain plus solubles does increase the rate of oxidation during retail display, which can be translated into a more rapid loss of red color and, of course, a decline in the uh, discoloration or an increase in the discoloration in wet distillers grain fed cattle. I do not have the slide to follow, but I'll just tell you that some very preliminary data of our laboratory shows that if we feed vitamin E to those animals for